Hey, good morning. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to start in a minute or two um, a short presentation, uh, a story about mass customization and how technology can help it. Uh, my name is Guy Zimmerman from uh, Cornit Digital. Uh, I'm heading the marketing and the uh, business development. Um, and um, I am going to use a little bit of my experience as an as a actual fashion garment manufacturer for major brands. So I'll try to connect the uh, technology with the trends in the industry and the, uh, and the supply chain uh, challenges that everybody are facing. Um, okay, I think we'll begin. Um, just a quick question um, for the audience. Uh, who is uh, a printer? We have printers in the crowd. Thank you. We have uh, brands. Or Thank you. Um, technology players, digital players. Fantastic. Any um, academy, university, academic uh, research? No. OK, good. So we have industry. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 how would say the subject is is mass customization, uh, and believe it or not, if it's even in the Wikipedia today, uh, it's a well known um, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, term uh, in multiple industries. Uh, the question now is how do we implement mass customization in textile, which is always. Uh, more challenging than any other industry. So the big question is why and how can we make it happen? Now will be a little bit commercial, a little bit of uh, sense of humor. Uh, that's a little tiny help for us. Uh, but that's not the, the whole answer. Um, today uh, in fashion and home textile, which is basically also fashion, uh, everybody wants to be unique. That's, uh, I think that in the 80s, everybody wants to be the same and uh, wear Gap and, uh, and uh, champion t-shirts and uh, Max and Spencer used to sell the same, the same underwear for everybody. Um, today, it's not the case. Uh, today, everybody wants to uh, have his own style, his own influence of what he's using and wearing and designing on clothes and at home as well. Uh, so what did brands and retailers did over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years? First, they started with giving more seasons, like instead of two seasons a year, four, six, eight, and then like the Zara model, every three weeks, parts of the store are changing every three weeks. Fantastic, okay, so you can, go to the shop every month and see something else and feel that you get some, some value of change, of, of, uh, of selection, etc. Then um, uh, the number of styles and designs and prints and colors and, and silhouettes has increased dramatically. You used to make three sizes, nude, black, white, melange, that's it. No, today it doesn't work. You have hundreds of designs and styles over multiple seasons. Fantastic. Um, and lastly, most of the retailers today are working on a regional and even store basis um, assortment, a planogram, floor plan, and even ordering. So the supply chain today in many retailers, mostly in the Western world, are based on store level predictions and ordering from distribution centers, etc. So you don't make one style and sell it around the world, you make multiple styles and each store decides and optimizes what is, she use, what is this store need and what do the customer in this region are like more or less. Okay, great, that was good for a while. Uh, but it put a lot, a lot of pressure on the sourcing, on the supply chain. Fashion and textile supply chain is horrible. A buyer 
uh, and um, let's say let's say a buyer. Okay, the whole sourcing system of large retailers and brands that still dominate this industry are facing uh, multiple uh, challenges and constraints. The lead time becomes shorter. The cost targets are getting lower, while the while the cost of the inputs are getting higher. Energy and labor are getting higher. Inventory is becoming a nightmare because you don't have 10 styles, you have 250 styles and then change, they change every three weeks. So inventory is booming by definition. Design innovation, it's not enough to give the product on time, on cost. Designers are going crazy every season from winter to spring to summer to holiday, they change the whole concept. They want to be the first. They want new, new techniques, they want new effects, they want to do lace, they want to, do, uh, 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 they want to change the trims, they want the prints to, to relate to the trims. They, they, they want more and more and more, and the supply chain is becoming more and more challenging. Those players are putting more and more resources, tools, labor, buying offices, uh, in, in order to integrate into the supply chain and, and try to manage that. And this is a big bet, a big bet on what I'm going to order, when I'm going to commit, for how much, and how I'm going to uh, manage the overruns and the excess uh, production. Because nobody knows exactly how many uh, yellow T-shirts are going to be sold. Nobody knows. If you meet this person, I'll be happy to, to work with him. Everybody knows that, uh, I don't know, around 20, 30 percent of uh, the, the, the theoretical value of the produced goods is marked down. Okay? Just a um, simple example. There is a, a, an off-price uh, network or chain in, in the U.S. called TJ Maxx. You know them? The turnover of TJ Maxx, which is based Purely, uh, okay, 85% on overruns of brands. The, over, the, the revenue of this company is very similar to Nike. I don't know if you knew that. So you can, and I, and I don't think they're less profitable. So you can build a business of $25 billion with 3,000 stores based purely on overruns of production of other brands. They don't, they don't do any design, they don't do any inventory, nothing. They get the bulk, they buy it, they put a label, they put it in the store, end of story. And they sell it less than the price that the brands pay to buy it. That's what we call cut your losses. So it's a true problem of the industry and there's, and there's very little they, they can do with the current infrastructure and the supply chain. Obviously, everything I'm going to say uh, going forward is, is, is starting to happen, but changing a, a trillion dollar industry is not happening overnight. This is a 10, 15 years process. The problem exists, everybody understands it. What I claim, or let's say the, the, the vision I, I see, is that moving from, the industry will have to move from a model of retail stores and scale uh, efficiencies based supply chain to online platforms and on demand supply chain. It has to happen. Okay, there's no reason. The, the reason to go to the store today is becoming less and less relevant. And, and the building very efficient supply chain infrastructure in low cost countries, uh, uh, putting commitments on, on, on raw materials is becoming less relevant and less effective because you, you're, you're, you're building a huge factory in India but you ask them to produce in, in minimum quantities of 100 or 200 so what's the point okay and then and then half of that you 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 mark down so that doesn't work okay it doesn't work anymore yes the supply chain became much more flexible yes there are techniques to make it better fantastic but this is trying to bend to try to put the circle in the the, the, the square in the circle, it, it's not it's not gonna sustain uh, with today's world, with today's uh, uh, sharing of information, with today social networks, etc. Uh, this is the vision I see, and I'll show you a few examples of how it's happening. So 
the step one, when the, the, the internet was invented, the, the brand said, you know what, fantastic. Why should we only sell through the stores? Let's put websites out there and sell our goods through the websites. Very convenient, yes. The sales started at half a percent of the revenue, now maybe 3% of the revenue, maybe 5% of the revenue. Okay, it's nice. But the business model is still completely irrelevant because the only change is that instead of people going to the shop and choosing the product, they now choosing the same product from the same supply chain, from the same distribution center, at the same uh, 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 manufacturing cost, and you have to ship it to them. By the way, the profitability of the online channels of the major brands is sometimes worse than the store, the store margins. And they can put less inventory there, le less selection, um, they incur more costs because at the end of the day, the, the government has to do the whole way from the general line and lie in the warehouse and wait that somebody will order it online. You still can't predict what people will, will order. You still uh, can't manage and predict your, your, your inventory. So you're basically at the same point with a new and sexy and nice uh, marketing channel. But it's not changing the paradigm. Step two, you can't stop water from flowing into the, in the ocean. Uh, personalized, small online businesses started to fill up the gap. Instead of taking a, a selection of a huge global brand and putting a subset on a, on a virtual store, they started to reverse the whole thing. You can, you can today open a store on, online, it's free, you don't need to pay fixed cost. And they started in small quantities, produce for demand. In some cases, these guys don't even make the garment before they have been paid for it. Okay? Think of it. Instead of designing a line six months ahead, making commitments, putting an order three months ahead, crazy supply chain, and then, okay, somebody's ordering online at the same price, like they buy it in the store. So these guys. They only sit on grades and they have their, their capacity ready. They only make the garment or finish the garment after it's been ordered and paid for. Think about the, 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 the end, they can charge more because it's personalized. You chose it, you made your shirt, so I'm taking three, four, five bucks more. So I'm making more money, I have less cost, I don't have inventory issues. But those were still very small players. I know if you know, so you all know that the t-shirt online websites, some of them are huge today. Some of them are making millions of, of, uh, of units, whether it's in commercial or, or uh, sport or licensing. Uh, there are interesting samples like uh, Wooly, Luli, Doodle, I don't know if you know them. This is a, a, a house, uh, a, a lady from, uh, a mother from, uh, I think, North Carolina. It started on Facebook, a business for child clothes, and she's making it in the Far East uh, on demand. And she, I think today, probably over $20 million. Uh, she has no, she has nothing, no fixed cost, no assets, nothing. Just design stuff and wait for orders and make the garments and ship them. So. So this is what's happening. The, the crowd, the, 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 the the reality is starting to create solutions. This is an example for sport, uh, sport online sport uh, ordering uh, system, to, and this is huge market in the US, huge, huge, huge. And when I say huge, I'm talking about billions of garments, okay? I think today people are buying online sport garments more than they buy branded garments in the stores in the US. I don't have the, the exact numbers, but it's starting to, to be the major market. So what did the brands do? Uh, they said, okay, we need to catch up. So they came up with uh, multiple attempts to do personalization, online personalization uh, businesses. Some of them are actually very successful, like uh, Nike ID, for example. I don't know if you know Nike ID. 
you can choose uh, the model of the shoe, you can choose whatever colors of any part of the shoe, you can even order your initials on the back of the shoe, you can even order a print of Levron James on the, uh, on the front of the shoe, whatever you want, fantastic. Obviously they charge a little bit more, um, and it's a great business, and it's really, this is hitting on the point of demand, but it's backlashing on the supply chain. How can you make millions of shoes, each one is different? How can you do that? It's horrible. Um, it actually increased the, the, the level of inventory, because you need to sit on multiple types and colors and, and sizes of raw materials ready to assemble the shoe because you need to, to get uh, to be in a very short uh, return time. So the inventory levels did not go down. Sometimes it even goes up on different parts of the chain. Uh, the, the inventory becomes more expensive because you're not sitting on grade fabric, you're sitting on, 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 on uh, dyed fabric or printed fabric or sometimes even cut fabric. So you, you put more money in your inventory. Uh, and the cost per unit goes up because the it's not mass production with the same style. You need to, to, to customize each, each, each garment, each shoe. So the cost, of, cost goes up. So, you still, so they solve the demand side, but they, sti they still don't have a good, solid solution for the supply side. Obviously, um, um, uh, we believe that uh, digital printing is a major, major solution to, uh, to the industry. It doesn't solve everything. It doesn't solve dyeing challenges. It doesn't solve uh, cut and sew challenges. Um, but it still brings you very large, a very large steps towards being able to, to, to deal with mass production in a personalized manner. If you use digital, the minimum quantity is, is one, is less than a meter, is less than one, gar is one garment. The setup time is close to zero. Uh, and you can locate it anywhere. So you can change your supply chain. Why do, why do the cut and sew factory need to, to wait three weeks before they get the printed fabrics and only then they can start cutting and sewing? Why, why can't they just print and cut and sew exactly what they need for that day? I, I mean, why? because the old technology cannot support that. You cannot move dyeing and finishing and, and printing facilities from place to place. There are environmental issues, there are custom issues, there are raw materials issues, there are expertise issues, whatever, you name it. Digital technologies can, can, can change it, can change the paradigm. Um, in some cases, and yes, this is still the beginning, the dreams come true. The dreams come a reality. Uh, I chose to show here uh, a player, a North American player, uh, that I think presented in FESPA last year. Uh, and they can make for you any amount of multiple types of fabrics on demand on a three days or seven days cycle made in the USA at any design you want. They have a bank of two, two million designs created by their customers and you can load your own your own design so the paradigm is changed even further because the designers are now not the brand designers the designers are not the IKEA designers the designers are us okay if I come up with a nice design and I load it there I am getting paid if somebody else is using it the whole world is going upside down if, it, if you used to have a designer sitting in a, in a, in a design room, in a, in a, in a studio, uh, working in a team, looking for trends, coming up with a small selection, sending it to sampling in, in, uh, in China, waiting three weeks to get it back, changing his mind, changing the colors, can't match the colors, wait again, then make the order, and then find out that people don't like flower this season. They actually want fish, so, or they want leopard, or whatever. What do you do? You just wasted a whole lot of the time. Today, everybody theoretically can order exactly the design he wants and create the design he wants and order any amount he wants and he can order again exactly the same design 
a year later at any amount he wants. And it's going to be exactly the same design. Nothing's going to change. Nobody needs to recreate the screens. Nobody needs to re uh, prepare the, 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 the colors on the kitchen color. No, nobody needs to do that anymore in some cases. Okay, I, I said it's a huge industry, trillion dollar industry. You can't change it overnight. So basically, this is an example of a reality that comes through. On the other side of this little wall, uh, there are three sofas. I don't know if you noticed them. Have you? Those are the sofas. Let me try. Okay, it's upside down. But those are the sofas. Some of you may like the design, some of you may not like the design. But I'm sorry, I chose the design. But okay. <laughs> we made those sofas under the, uh, the theme of uh, deep dive and ocean and water. And we downloaded the designs from Shutterstock and we printed it printed it in-house and we made it uh, we made the sofas in, in two days and we bought it here and we have three sofas that some people really love some people don't don't love so okay great so you, you can choose another design whatever it's not you don't need to choose what's in the store today so later once we finish you can go to the other side see the sofas sit on the sofas feel the sofas those are real sofas that if I would put them in a store in the furniture store it would look like any other sofa to you. You wouldn't think that somebody designed it or chose the design seven days ago, printed it and made it and shipped it here. So in, in a nutshell, this is the story. You can duplicate it for t-shirts, you can duplicate it for, for, for dress, you can duplicate it for sport garments, you can duplicate it for shoes, but the vision is to change the paradigm. The customer is the designer, the customer chooses what he wants, the supply chain is flexible, is on demand, is next to the market, and it creates a whole new trend in, uh, in textile design and fashion. That's it. Thank you.